Robert Gillard to the, it's not a lectern, to the desk, to the front, uh, who is a reading German and comparative cultural studies at Queen Mary University of London, Queen Mary, am I still allowed to call it a college? Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's a university. It's, there's, we, we, there's, there's, there's a lot of discussion. Um, you would not believe how much ink is spent over this comma. But if I, <laughs> if I, if I, if I, every time I publish something, I have to be absolutely sure that I remove any comma between the um, the U and the Y. So it's Queen Mary University of London or Queen Mary University of London. We're trying to have it both ways, but we're not a college. That's his institution. <laughs> Uh, he is, 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 uh, is uh, amongst his several books, uh, edited collections, and. What have you done? What have you touched? I've sent a display off. Is that terrible? I'm clearly, yes. I'm dead. I'm just waiting for it to be done. Sorry. I should never touch technology. <laughs> So loud. <laughs> and slow. <laughs> uh, so main areas of, of, of work as displayed on, on the website, Robert Fichte, Uwe Jonsson, Brecht, Legacy, Johann Peter Hebel, you, you went through the centuries. Really. I, I, yeah, I'm, I, uh, yes, I'm, I'm a jack of all trades so, and an expert in none. Um, <laughs> uh, Today it's uh, Elsa Bernstein and her reception. I am really a complete interloper here. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to apologize for is that I haven't been to the trouble of translating all the German quotations. Um, there will be German quotations, they don't matter very much. Um, they're just saying more um, concisely what I would have said in English and probably do say in English. And this is, this is basically just to get around. Um, on the 1st of May 2009, I organized an Anglo-German workshop which brought Suzanne Codd and Kate Newey to QMUL to discuss the image of women playwrights. At that workshop, Suzanne Codd regaled us with her shocking anecdote about how information concerning Ernst Bosmar, which had been full and fulsome in the original 1911 edition of Albert Zerbel's Dichtung und Dichter der Zeit, fails to feature at all in Kurt Bohoff's revised edition of 1963. In the half century between the first and the second wave feminism, one of the most prominent German playwrights of the period covered by this conference had simply been swept under the car. There is, of course, nothing remotely unusual about this. After all, literary histories, and especially histories of the theatre, have been marginalizing women with malice aforethought at least since the age of Goethe. But that is still no reason not to get cross about it. And that is why I'm here. I am no expert in Jewish studies. I'm not even sure that the person I'm going to be talking about can properly be described as a Yudin. And some of my remarks will concern a period which no longer strictly belongs to modernity. Yet I do very much believe in the need to rethink the canon of German language literature and the position in it of women, of Jews, and of Jewish women. Just by being here, by reminding you of the existence of Ernst Bosmer and what has been done to her, I hope to go some way to repairing the damage caused by Orthoff and those like him. Now, um, the last time I tried to speak about the author I want to discuss here in a conference at the University of Kent on the 19th century German short story, I caused confusion by referring at different times to Elsa Porges, Elsa Bernstein, and Ernst Bosmer. The fact of the matter is that these three names refer to the same person. She was born as a Pogus, not quite 150 years ago, on the 28th of October, 1866. She became Elsa Bernstein in 1890, when she married the lawyer, political activist, journalist, and playwright Max Bernstein. Ernst Wasmer is the pseudonym under which she published her plays from 1891 onwards, and Elsa Pogus brackets Elst Osmar is the name under which she published the play Johannes Hapner in 1904. The only text, as far as I know, that was first published under the name of Elsa Bernstein was her posthumous memoir of Theresienstadt, Das Leben als Drama. 
mention of Tunisian shut, of course, also brings into play another confusing and potentially contentious aspect of the life and identity of Elsa Bernstein, the Paulus. Of her parents, Ulrike Zuffenias von Bayo, who published a groundbreaking dissertation on our author in, 18, in 1985, writes, Ihr Vater Heinrich Paulus, wie auch die Mutter Wilhelmine, geboren in Meruris, entstammt in dem deutsch-jüdischen Bildungsbürgertum Prags, waren aber evangelisch getauft. Prague keeps coming back, doesn't it? For Elsa, her Protestant faith was not just a matter of expedience, as is powerfully demonstrated by the fact that she continued to profess it even in Theresienstadt, expected to revert to the beliefs of her ancestors. Referring to her as a Jew, then, risks falling back into national socialist categories. And yet, just as her male pseudonym did not save her from misogyny, so her baptism did not save her from anti-Semitism. Sarah Colvin, for example, notes that her contemporaries made, I quote, frequent comments on her femaleness and only slightly less frequent remarks on her Jewishness. And it seems to me that this kind of double, double bind can be seen as characteristic of the experience of significant numbers of Jewish women, especially Jewish women writers, at the turn of the century. It is also a persistent theme in Rosmer's work. Because Rosmer is a Jewish woman, her work has come down to us only in incomplete and fragmentary form. By all accounts, her papers were destroyed by the Nazis when she was sent to Theresienstadt in 1942. And because she is one of those legions of women writers who do not make it into the male canon, many of her published works are hard to track down. Her collection of novellas Madonna, for example, exists in Europe in a single copy, preserved in the Bayerische Staatsbibliothek. Her poems are very widely scattered, and much work will be required to bring them together. And there is strong evidence to suggest that, contrary to the impression created by most library catalogues, she did not in fact stop writing around the end of the First World War, and probably did not stop publishing then either, but continued to produce literary works right until her death in 1949. Again, much detective work will be required to unearth these texts, and it is not, unless it's not infrequently the case with great women writers, many of them may be lost forever. <laughs> In her bibliography, Zofonias von Bayel lists some 20 plays, 10 novellas, and 30 poems. And it is as a dramatist that Rosmer is best known. One of her plays, Dämmerung, was included in Ray Cowan's two-volume anthology, Drama des Naturalismus, of 1981, and translated by Susanna Cord in 2003. Another, Maria Arndt, is included in Catherine Kelly's anthology, Modern Drama by Women, 1880s to 1930s from 1996, and was produced in Chicago in 2002. Indeed, if the internet is to be believed, and I really don't believe it, another production is coming off in Broadway at the moment. It is to these plays, and others like them, that the vast majority of criticism <coughs> on Rosner has been devoted. And there is general agreement that in them she explores with great dramatic effectiveness and a technique derived at least partly from Ibsen, one of the central issues of her day and ours, the impossible position of modern women, caught between the desire for self-determination and the social pressure to conform, unable to love men without giving into patriarchy, and unable to, 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 unable to be mothers to their children without falling victim to the deprivations of discord. For the women of these dramas, there is no happy ending. Rather, the dramatic machinery exactly mirrors the forces of society, and the twists and turns of the plot show how the protagonists are lost in a labyrinth of words and opinions, roles and expectations from which there is no escape. One of the avenues explored is, in fact, lesbianism. It is not for nothing that Rosbach's first success was called Via Drei but it is thwarted by the special bond of parenthood even when the child in question is still born. Another is independent activity in the arts and sciences. The main protagonist of Demerung is an ophthalmologist, but this activity is seen as incompatible with fulfilling relationships and often has to be relinquished as soon as a man enters the frame. And each of the plays tries out a different means of self-determination, only to recognize, as Heather Gabler does, that the only freedom left in the end may be that of turning patriarchy's pistols on oneself. 
a solution that is uncomfortable, has an uncomfortable beigeschmack of Emilia Galotti about it. For feminists especially, these plays can make distressing reading. For the best, if the best thing that can happen is that a woman commits suicide, something must be seriously wrong. The distress is compounded by a lack of performances, because the emotional effect of seeing a fate enacted with all the pity, fear, frustration, and anger that implies is necessarily flattened when the page is when the, when the play is only read. But I'm still far from sure that this justifies Sarah Colvin's deployment of words like masculinist, dreadful, or trying. Colvin rightly objects to the descriptions that Rosmer puts in the mouths of men. But instead of comparing them to similar, uh, similar aberrations that are presented as such in, say, Ibsen, she looks at the level of the text for markers of irony and, when she doesn't find them, reduces the play to what she calls a reiteration of gender norms and lays the blame for them not on the men or on patriarchy, but on the allegedly complicit author. What in the works of a man is expected and condoned is, in the work of a woman, misjudged and condemned. And that, it seems to me, is unfair. Comparable forms of unfairness continue to dog the reception of Rosmer's single, single most successful text. Her play Königskinder has enjoyed enduring success as the libretto to an opera by Engelbert Humperdinck, first produced in 1910 and regularly revived. And yet, as Heike Schmidt points out in her chapter on Elsa Bernstein, von Bernstein aber als Verfasserin der Königskinder spricht niemand mehr. Überdauert hat die Zeit das Werk eines berühmten Komponisten. Nor is oblivion the only fate to befall the author of Königskinder. During her lifetime, she was persistently perceived as derivative. To show how this works, here is the entry on the play from the English version of Wikipedia. But unbounded admiration was elicited by Königskinder, a dramatic fairy tale. Though its plot was simple, the beauty of the theme and its poetry was such as to class it with Ludwig Fulda's Der Talisman. Although Engelbert Humperdinck was dissatisfied with his first concert setting of Königskinder in 1997, an avant-garde melodrama which demanded an innovative speak-singing technique from its soloists, despite production challenges, it nevertheless enjoyed over 120 performances in Europe, he persuaded Bernstein in 1907 to authorize a traditional opera setting which debuted in German at the Metropolitan Opera in New York in December 2010. That version is still performed. Now, I don't know how many of you are avid advocates of Ludwig Fuller's Der Talisman, but I think it is fair to say that this play is not canonical and can therefore serve neither as a landmark nor as a benchmark. So it is not easy at first sight to understand why it should be adduced as a point of comparison to Königskinder. A possible answer, I think, is to be found in Julian Wiegand's Geschichte der Deutschen Dichtung, a single-volume history of German literature published in 1922, when both Rosmer and Fulger were still alive. There, in a discussion of Gerhard Hauptmann's Versunkene Glocke, Wiegand allows himself the remark, vorangegangen waren Fulger der Talisman und Rosmer Königskind. What Wiegand is referring to here is the turn away from naturalism in German theatre. Fulda is famous, among many other things, for organizing the first unofficial production of Ibsen's Ghosts at a time when German censorship would not allow that play to be put on in public. Rosma, of course, owes her name to an Ibsen play. Both Fulda and Rosma had written texts that were indebted to Ibsen and his exploration of the socio-sexual compulsions operating in bourgeois and putty bourgeois media in the mid to late 19th century. For one of them then to take up the theme of Andersons and the other to deconstruct a grim fairy tale looks like a radical new departure, even if for some it might seem like a departure in the wrong direction. One of the very many places to which that departure might lead is Die Versunken und Glocke. And so we find Rosmer and Fulda yoked together as precursors of a famous apostate naturalist. Or, to put it another way, we find them made jointly responsible 
for a fall away from a movement which is properly modern and forward-looking and produce texts which are still performable today towards an aberration which, because of its mysticism, unrealism and sentimentality, is rightly consigned to a little frequented niche in the dustbin of literary history, neo-romanticism. Now, there is so much that is wrong with this that I scarcely know how to start. But at the very least, natural justice would require that it should not be the plagiarist and the epigony who goes down in history, but the groundbreakers. As Schmidt puts it, quoting from a 1908 study of contemporary drama, erneut drängt sich die Frage auf, welche Mechanismen wirksam geworden sind, wenn Bernsteins Königskinder ein Jahr vor Hauptmanns versunkene Glocke gedruckt, schon damals dem Publikum als Nachtreter erschienen sind, wo sie Bahn gebrochen haben. Moreover, the whole idea of Königskinder as a simple, beautiful fairy tale is wholly untenable and could only have arisen because that text is here being tarred with the sentimental brush of Hartmann's later productions. Nor is there anything remotely romantic about Grosman's play. On the contrary, having set up the preconditions for a fairy tale ending, it disappoints our expectations about as comprehensively as, as it is possible to imagine. So far from being recognized for what they are, moving into the castle and living happily ever after, our royal children, who ultimately are far more children than royal, are set upon by a hateful crowd and driven into exile, where they suffer such pains of hunger and cold that, in the end, they return to the place where the goose girl grew up, sell their crown to the profiteer who was responsible to for their banishment in the first place, and die in ecstasy as a result of eating a loaf of bread into which the goose girl itself had, at the behest of the witch, baked a special kind of poison. The witch, in the meanwhile, has, of course, been burned at the stake. The musician who introduced the vigilantes to her is tortured and has his legs broken. And the only glimmer of hope is in the form of a generation too young to be implicated in the collective guilt. It is not for nothing that Peter Screen says of the play, Königskinder is a fairy tale for modern folk who no longer believe in happy endings. The golden years could not last as its author must have said. <coughs> By the end of the 1930s, the precocious little girl who had been presented to Wagner at the 1876 Bayreuth Festival had begun to fall foul of the race laws introduced by a regime which claimed to champion the German cultural values she stood for. As well as conveying with uncanny accuracy those human and social forces which make fascism possible and plausible, Königskinder also undertakes the properly feminist task of rehabilitating witches. At the start of the play, the witch is presented in a very unsympathetic light as a rebarbative misanthropist whose cynicism is constructed strongly and unfavorably with the naive humanism of the goose girl. By the end of the play, though, we not only understand her unflattering view of human society, we are made to share it. At a deeper level than the political, her prediction about the anointment of the royal children turns out to be perfectly accurate. So too does her prescient decision to bake the fatal bread. Given that final act, whereby her magic makes it possible for the goose girl to die in ecstasy rather than agony, it becomes possible to see in her relationship with the goose girl a sort of unacknowledged affection. And that, in turn, begins to suggest a mother-daughter bond. In the light of this, we can begin to understand that the isolation the two live in at the start of the play may, not, may, may be part of a strategy to protect the goose girl from the horrors which the witch knows awaits her. And without wanting to stretch the parallel too far, I think it is worth it pointing out that both the isolation and the horror have a particular resonance when applied to women on the one hand and Jews. If there is an assumption that Königskinder, a Deutsches Märchen written by a woman, must be somehow sweet, nice, and removed from reality, that is because masculinist criticism tends to take the view that all women's writing is sweet, nice, and removed from reality. In other words, women write fairy tales because realism is beyond them. As Africa infamously puts it in reflective one of Rosmus novellas, Hier bewältigt sie auch die realistisch gemeinte Handlung ganz mit Märchenmitteln. Schließlich sind es frauenhafte Mittel. 
And if realism is beyond them, how much further beyond them must be the most noble and public, the most serious and the most uplifting of all literary genres, tragedy. Accordingly, when in the years between 1897 and 1910, Rosmer writes three neoclassical tragedies, it is not the tragedy of them, not the tight exploitation of dramatic techniques ultimately derived from Shakespeare that interests the contemporary reviewers and later critics, but questions of source and setting. Ulrike von Sophia Rosenbeil, for example, quotes the contemporary critic Hans von Gumpen. You couldn't make these names up, could you? <laughs> von, and Sophia Rosenbeil quotes Hans von Gumpen there. And comes to the astonishing conclusion that these plays, which insistently equate war with the arbitrary and brutal exercise of patriarchal power, are actually escapist and help to pave the way for the First World War. Eine solchermaßen rückwärtsgewandte Ideologie wie die der Neuklassiker, die, wie auch Achill beweist, sorgfältig jeglichen Bezug zu den Problemen der von der modernen Technologie beherrschten Gegenwart vermied und in ihrem eher hohlwirkenden Erholkult zu dem verdächtig nah an die Ideale der Gründezeit anschloss, konnten keinen Weg zeigen, der zur Sprengung der mechanistischen Umklammerung des scheinbar allgewaltigen Industrialismus geführt hatte. Die Katastrophe ließ nicht lange auf sich warten. Die Euphorie beim Ausbruch der Ersten Weltkrieges war allgemein. Here too, I suspect, Rosmer is being made guilty by association. What is here, <coughs> for, for what is here being said of her might more plausibly apply to the tetralogy on Greek, tetralogy on Greek themes which Gerhard Hauptmann wrote under the National Socialist. Accordingly, as Heike Schmidt again notes, ein ganz ähnliches Schicksal im Vergleich zu einem im Vergleich zu einer anderen Arbeit Hauptmanns mussten Bernsteins Dramatisierungen von Stoffen aus der griechischen Mythologie hinnehmen. Sigrid scholz Novak for her part, notes another telling tendency in the criticism of these plays. In particular, she quotes a review by Julius Barr in which he I quote, criticize the author for changing the image of Odysseus. This, of course, is spectacularly to miss the point. Since Sappho, women have been deliberately rewriting Homer, partly because the irredeemably patriarchal nature of the society writes her cries out for feminist tradition, partly because the figures he evokes have attained the status of myth, and partly because his status as one of the founders of the Western canon makes him available for the sort of intertextual play which is one of the few ways in which women can make space for themselves in a field that is not designed to include them. Rosma is no exception to this. Her Nausicaa points to a significant gap in Homer and redresses it, not least because she's given a degree of fatal agency that goes way beyond the feminine role of carer to which her namesake like Dido, empowered with self-determination, she cannot, of course, survive the departure of her married lover. But she can at least end things on her own terms. And to that extent, she makes an instructive contrast with another Nausicaa figure, the notably passive child flower in Elisabeth Langesser's Frühling, 1960. That child, of course, was also Cordelia Edvardson, a justly celebrated Jewish woman writer of a different generation. And what Horst Krüger says about Edvardson's book, Gebranntes Kind sucht das Feuer, could apply equally to the book which I deliberately and finally wish to exceed the framework of this conference, Bernstein's Theresienstadt Memoir. Dies ist ein schmales Buch, writes Krüger, aber es hat Gewicht. And he goes on, dieses Buch gehört nicht in die Reihe wichtige KZ-Literatur, die, wenig gelesen, immerhin ausreichend auf dem Markt ist. Es ist ganz anders. For obvious reasons, most of those who wrote who have written memoirs about Theresienstadt were young when they went there. Many of them also postpone the moment of recounting their experiences to a point when they are, about, when they are worried about their legacy. Elsa Bernstein, on the other hand, was already an old woman of 75 when she was deported from her Munich flat. And she wrote her book almost immediately after her release from the concentration camp. She is not looking back across a lifetime. She is telling contemporaries what they were capable of. 
throughout the text, she presents herself quite explicitly and deliberately as a blind eye witness. Nor is she coming to terms with trauma or trying to explain what the trauma has done to her subsequent personality. For exceptionally, Bernstein's book is not about herself. Instead, it does in an exemplary way something that very few Holocaust memoirs manage. It moors. It covers all those themes that are familiar from the other memoirs and which Wood Schwertfeger enumerates in her study on the subject the mica and the Red Cross, the tensions and the small acts of kindness, the hectoring and the lectures, the battle for physical survival and the joys of intellectual converse, the vermin and the infamous roll call. The way she does so, though, in each case, is bound up with a very particular perspective, which enables her to grieve for those who did not survive. None of this, though, impresses Dagmar Gouwen. In a book she co-edited with Bernstein, she lays into the memoir with extraordinary vehemence. For her, the book is, I quote, conventional and conservative, end of quotation, and Bernstein, I quote, failed because she was unable to develop linguistic and conceptual tools appropriate to her unforeseen circumstances, end of quotation. Although she freely admits that Bernstein was old, frail, and blind, which might perhaps be taken as a reason enough for not writing in an environment in which Braille typewriters will not have been exactly in rich supply. Um, she reproached Darmstein, who, despite everything, did in fact produce a book of 130 printed pages, with the fact that she, I quote, left no written record more extensive than her memoir about her ordeal and her quotation. After all, Hagi Adler, who was not only young and strong and sighted, but also had the inestimable advantage of being a man, managed to produce a document in nearly a thousand pages that only took six years longer than Bernstein was to live to complete the task. Careful inspection, though, reveals that what Lorenz really will not forgive Bernstein for is the fact that she is not a Jew and that she liked Wagner. Like the Czechs in Theresienstadt, Lorenz hates Bernstein because she is German and thus throws an ironic light on the problem that Schlafig advises as ethnic groups. In the process, of course, she's indulging in a form of racial prejudice which is every bit as destructive as the anti-Semitism which Lorenz and after her Deborah Vietor Englander falsely accused Bernstein. As I have tried to show here, this travesty is merely the tip of an iceberg. Again and again, literary history fails to do justice to the works of Hans Rosmer, Elsa Polkis, and Elsa Bernstein because it cannot resist the temptation to put her into pigeonholes on the basis of what can only be called prejudices. Even the feminists are apt egregiously to misinterpret her texts, as when Chris Whedon says Maria Arndt, which is a play about the impossibility of squaring the demands of the heart with the requirements of society that is about women's education. Having shoehorned her into naturalism, critics do not know how to deal with their historical and mythological tragedies. Having decided that she's a playwright, they are not even prepared to discuss her prose. Having decided that she's a woman, they assume that she write, what she writes is private and of little interest beyond the sphere of the domestic and the documentary. And having decided that she's not Jewish enough, they rubbish what, to my mind, is one of the finest of all books about Theresa. There is nothing remotely unusual or surprising about this, that it won't do. We must go on getting cross, and we must go on saying no. Rosen's work is neither masculinist nor Frauenhaft, neither escapist nor anti-Semitic. And perverse though it might seem to say so here, she herself is neither a woman nor a Jew.